Hello, this is Palico Page, and after a year of being in early access, the Curious Expedition 2 has finally got to version 1.0, so I figured now would be a good time to just jot down on video format some hints and tips from the game which I've picked up whilst playing through. Now, for anyone who's new to my channel, I have just completed the normal campaign without dying from playing it blind so um, I like to think that I, I know a little bit of what I'm talking about plus the fact that I've had over 150 hours in the original game as well these are things which I have noticed is uh, slightly different compared to the original game and you may not know if you've played the original game coming to this one or if you are completely new hopefully these little hints and tips will help you out in the meantime to you finding your feet and, and getting out there now I will just say there are no spoilers here we're not going to go into intricate details about the different explorers or trek members that you may come across or even items this is just a quick heads up on the what I have found to be the best way of approaching the game and details which I think is worth noting if you are new to the game which might not necessarily come across as there on the page for you to see without having a few playthroughs so this is just just to help you out really is to make things a bit more convenient a shortcut if you will but by the by let's crack on shall we first things first when you click new game you will have three difficulty settings we have traveler which is the easy mode we have adventurer which is the normal mode and we have lunatic which is the hard 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 mode now i have not played on lunatic yet i did want to complete the story mode on normal before cracking on with banging my head against the wall for the next several hundred episodes so i would definitely recommend adventurer adventure in itself is quite difficult if you are new to the game don't be put off by it. everything that you do will accumulate towards opening up new items for you with the different clubs which are available within the game which we'll go into in a minute uh, so crack on with normal or adventure mode if you prefer uh, then there's a new thing which comes up now you can choose what you want your death penalty to be regardless of what difficulty you choose you can decide on whether you want to just restart the expedition if you die mid expedition whether you want to wipe the year and start from the beginning of that year or you can wipe the entire campaign iron man mode if you will and ultimately this is up to you uh, the nice thing about restarting expeditions if you've made a careless mistake you can jump back into it and hopefully not make the same mistake again as far as wipe years concerned it's an interesting way to go again if you want it to be a little bit more difficult uh, the thing you need to think about though when it comes to doing that one is you will need to rebuff up your new characters which can be a bit awkward but by the by that's that's entirely up to you and uh wipe campaign well don't really need to say much more about that it is the traditional way to play the game if you're dead you're dead so that's the one i'll probably go to each time now the interesting thing i have seen about this is you can actually mix up the settings so you can play on easy on traveler difficulty if you want but you can have wipe campaign as your death penalty or vice versa you can play on lunatic hard mode or you can have restart expedition death penalties if you want to make it a little bit easier for you so mix and match find your niche see what works for you and give it a whirl now the next screen after this is where you choose your leader now originally you only get to choose from three leaders you have the big game hunter now their big unique selling point is they have a three ambush when attacking so that means when you decide to attack either a set of animals or, or natives or what have you you will get a three go which they cannot retaliate against and then you'll get another go after that just something to think of if you think you're going to be playing more aggressively through a single playthrough. Uh, now they tend to come with a nurse which gives you an increased heal speed and a hunting dog which finds a quail every 30 days. Now both of these items on these two trick members can be upgraded as they level up. You could argue that increased healing speed is very handy to have, especially at higher levels, because it means you'll be less damaged for shorter periods, which is great. And then you also have, um, with the hunting dog, finding a quail. Now, ultimately, it's a bit of free food. It's not a lot of free food. It's not the most dazzling perk when it comes to Trek members, but uh, they are completely faithful you've got no chance of losing your hunting dog or any pack animal for that matter so that's something you don't have to worry about as far as loyalty is concerned leader number two is anthropologist creates studies for native cultures with a plus 40 percent 
bonus for creating those studies and getting them back home after you finish the expedition. They come with a native shaman, which gives you plus 10 mushroom sanity. So rather than just getting the perk off any mushrooms you eat on trek, you also get plus 10 sanity, which can be pretty handy if you can find mushrooms. And they also come with a translator, which gives you plus one rest sanity when resting at a village which again can be pretty handy it depends on how you're getting on with the natives in the in that area at the time obviously if, if they're very annoyed with you they're not going to be wanting you to rest at the village so just something to mull over uh, but yeah as far as that's concerned anthropological studies they're all right it's fine if you can get into a village or if there's a village available if you can't then it's a bit of a null perk to have for a leader so again just something to think about and number three the cartographer now they create maps while exploring and they get to sell their maps at the end for plus 40 percent of what they would be usually worth pretty handy you're always going to be creating maps whilst you're exploring because you're always exploring and they come with a native which has a plus 15 percent view distance and a roma trader which gives you a bartering bonus when buying anything off anyone essentially for the first time you only get to use that bartering bonus once but it can be quite handy now as far as all these are concerned they all level up as well so that includes the ones for the anthropologist i would argue that the cartographer is the most useful leader to start with as a new person or as someone uh, having their first play through uh, the native with plus 15 view distance which again can be upgraded is very good it means obviously you can see further so you need to travel less or you can make a more educated decision on where you want to travel and the roma trader being able to knock money off any items you want however it's because they're more expensive or you just want to double up on items or triple up on items and not spend as much that is also very very useful now you may see that there are eight explorers in total there are certain prerequisites to opening up the other explorers they all seem pretty simple i'm not going to go into them here you can flick onto the old portraits yourself and have a look see but they all seem fairly simple uh one of them which we know is available is the plunderer that's the one i have played through uh, in my playthrough and uh, they can get sanity back from stealing jewels out of any items you find uh, any treasures you find which towards the end of my playthrough helps out incredibly but you are obviously sacrificing any fame that you may get from taking those treasures back but needs must and all that so there we go those are the characters that you can choose and then once you've chosen that character you get projected onto the screen of we paddy without the eiffel tower we're in 1886 paris it's the start of the world trade exhibition thingy majiggy and well things are going on now there are several little places you can go from the off there's also a couple which come up after your first expedition out and you come back to paris probably the most important one here is what they call the boussole cassier i'm pretty sure i'm still murdering how you say that but essentially it's the pub it's where everyone goes for a drink kicks their shoes off probably not it's actually a bit antisocial but sits down politely and has a beer and talks about their day there are some important things here which happen generally speaking whenever you leave to go on an expedition you will end up in the pub before you go where you'll have a random encounter be that with someone who's drinking in the pub or maybe something to do with the story or maybe if you're very lucky you might come across the odd famous explorer that may want to join you but by the by once you're there you get to choose generally from recruiting a new member to the trek which ultimately is always worth checking you, you may find that there are better people to recruit there or you may not have enough people in your trek party already and you want to add it's best to get up to maximum amount of trek members because because that will give you added dice, added perks, and added capacity for carrying stuff. So even if there's no one who ideally fits in with the way you want to play on that particular go, always get your trek members up, and then you can start to refine who you're going to have in that party. So yes, you can recruit new trek members. You also have the ability to visit the financier. Uh, with them, you can spend your tickets which you earn during uh, expeditions um, when you get back to give you more funds for the next expedition. Now, personally, I haven't got to the point where I've needed to rely on them for more money. But if by any means you have spare tickets, which again, we'll go into in a bit, you may want to give yourself more money if you decide you want to go on a harder difficulty expedition somewhere simply to give you the opportunity of having more items out there with you which you may find useful but again we'll go into the items in a little bit now another option which has popped up recently is change difficulty so if you are struggling or 
if you're not struggling, if you're if you're doing very, very well and you want to set yourself a bit more challenge, it seems that now you can actually change the difficulty of the playthrough you've got going currently on a whim. So if you find it's too hard and you want to take it down a notch, you can. If you find it's too easy and you want to take it up a notch, you can. Nice to have. Don't think personally I'll be messing with it. I do believe it can affect your achievements as well on, on, on certain difficulties if you decide to check it. So it's something which really I think you should or you'd want to choose uh, before you start playing and not mess about with it afterwards. But hey, I'm not you. Do, do what you want to do. <laughs> so other things to choose when you get back onto that map of Paris. There are three clubs available in this game, which is unique to this edition as opposed to the, the original. You have Lux Labs, uh, and it's run by a, a very plain-looking, uh, plain-mannered android, I suppose, or as much of an android as you can get in 1886. We have the Tai Chi Academy, who are like the mystical, altruistic type of academy with a monk that runs this, and the Royal Avalon Society, which are, well, they're British, so they're very stiff upper lip and all that, and, uh, well, they're all lovely people. Can't, can't say anything wrong with the Royal Avalon Society. Now, whenever you go on to an expedition, you do get to choose a club on who you want to represent whilst you're out there. And the reasoning behind this is that um, as you represent them and you bring back treasures and equipment after each expedition, you actually rank up in that club and open up new items and people and perks down the line. And obviously, the higher the level, the more stuff you open up. The nice thing about this is they are all permanent upgrades. So as soon as you get up to a level and you open up an item, if you were to completely die and start over again, those items will remain open. So that's why it's more of a rogue light this time around. And uh, the nice thing about that is obviously it means you're constantly progressing and it means that new strategies are always going to be open to you. Now, I haven't got to the point of opening everything up on my playthroughs yet, so we're not going to talk about the items here. However, I will just tell you quickly what the different perks of the clubs are. Ah, now these perks in themselves are all available to you regardless of what level you are. You don't have to be a certain level to access these, which is super because it means hopefully that they're going to help you out in your playthrough for whatever sort of area of uh, your trek or your items you want to enhance. So with the Lux Lab, they arguably have the most important unique service that can be offered to you whilst you're in Paris. They can actually upgrade your equipment on your characters. Now, when it comes to upgrading equipment, there are at times upgrades which seem to cost money and not actually do a lot. Now, this is something which I have fallen into the pit of despair about having a couple of choice words with comments on my uh, videos because they say oh well actually it's giving you x amount extra on attack but here's how i feel about upgrading items the most important thing in this game and uh, the first game isn't necessarily the damage or the um, quality of the die sides available to you be that through your characters or your items it's the quantity. It's okay if you have got three sides where you'll get 10 attack, let's say. However, it's not as good from a chance perspective as six sides with a five attack because at least you're guaranteed a damage of five as opposed to only 50% chance of getting 10. Now, this is even more important in this game because the die themselves uh, are used a lot more. Uh, you use them for attacks, you use them for uh, roles in situations so therefore to have as many sides available to you with an option and not just being blank as opposed to having higher numbers on lesser options I think is more so when it comes to actually upgrading equipment I'm at the point where if you can have an upgrade and it gives you extra sides to a die then it's worth doing as long as it's at a reasonable price if it is a minor upgrade on on size which you already have it might be worth going to somebody else and that other person which i'll go into in a minute is called the shady dealer so don't always go to Lux Labs to upgrade your equipment and upgrade equipment unless it has size being made available to you because it, nine times out of ten it can be more expensive to do that than it would be to just replace that item outright. But by the by, I'm, I'm getting far ahead of myself here. And that'll be in the more intricate tutorial that I'll do later on down the line. The Tai Chi Academy, they allow you to train your characters. So say, for instance, you are six, seven expeditions into the game and one of your super important Trek members perishes and you can't bring them back and you have to start afresh with a new one. Generally speaking, at the moment, they are roughly around the level that you are. But if you find they are slightly lower or there are certain people which you haven't been prioritizing when it comes to upgrading their levels, you can go to the Taishi Academy and for a certain amount of tickets, you can get them trained up 
uh, without having to be out in the fields as it were uh, something which i've used a couple of times it's not something which i rely on i tend to just let them all level up quite evenly whilst you're out uh, but as far as uh, that's concerned it's there if you need it and then we have the royal avalon society now they can cure ailments so any negative traits which either you or your trek members have you can actually get rid of but they only get rid of one negative trait per go now that in itself if you have any super bad negative traits is obviously a good thing however if you are lucky enough to come across a shaman whilst out in the field you can actually use them to get rid of all negative traits in one foul swoop so again if you've got tickets left over and you've got nothing better to spend them on and you've got some real bad negative ailments you need to get rid of or negative perks you need to get rid of before getting back out onto your next expedition you can always fall back on the royal avalon society but as i said unless it's something super super bad which is affecting the dynamic of the group personally i wouldn't worry about it too much so after you've got the club sorted and you've been to the pub once you've been on your first expedition and you've come back again you actually get an other option to choose from and that is the shady dealer the shady dealer He's a dodgy guy. He lives down the alleyway. He's a bit scruffy looking and he's got a few, let's say, black market items for you to buy if you so choose. Now, items generally you can pick up from pretty much anywhere. You can pick them up uh, whilst on the expedition. Uh, you can pick them up from the different clubs. But every so often the shady dealer does have a good deal on some items. And if you are, again, just employing someone into your group and uh, need to fit them out quickly then the shady dealer is always worth coming to have a look at now just referring back to what i said about the lux labs and the upgrading of the equipment it's always worth checking to see what the shady dealer has got every time you come back to paris those items will change every time so you won't necessarily have the same items available to you after one expedition to another that means that sometimes you can get better items from the shady dealer over what you already have if you were to use the same amount of uh, tickets which you have in your possession at the Lux Labs to upgrade an existing item. So this is where you really need to sort of jump to and fro and just, just see what's available and make that educated decision on whether you want to buy a new item for a person or upgrade an existing item you have. But again, we'll leave that to you. And then the last place you can go if you are very, very lucky is the Hatter. Now with the Hatter, all they do is hold the different hats you have won from taking part in club competitions. Now, it can be for all the clubs. It might be for just two specific clubs. But if that club were to win that particular competition, generally speaking, there is a fancy hat which you will then have available to you via the hatter. And you can pop into there and change your hat over. I personally have a Biggles helmet. That's the only thing I've got. Sometimes I wear it, sometimes I don't. But I'd like to think as I play more of this game and choose correctly who I can help win those club competitions, there will be a whole plethora of different hats I can wear so you're done in paris that is everything covered basics sorted next we have to pick an expedition now the nice thing about the expedition is you get three different expeditions to choose from depending on the difficulty you choose the one school two school or three school you will be rewarded with different amounts of starting money tickets for when you come back to paris and fame now fame does eventually accumulate into tickets uh, that is something which gets tallied up at the end of each expedition. So obviously the higher the fame, the more chance you've got of being nearer the next ticket, which in turn means you'll have more tickets, which means in turn you can spend more money whilst in Paris or spend more tickets whilst you're in Paris. So it's a case of weighing up the pros and cons of each island and objective made available to you on the difficulty that is come up. Once you've done that, you will go and click the sponsor you want to choose. Personally, I would just focus on the one club for the time being and open up as much as you can or at least up to the point where you've got several items you can choose from and then maybe skip to the next one open up a few more just to give you the the biggest options of um, items going into uh, the next expedition and then you are whisked away on your boat traveling across that big blue sea and just before you get onto these extraordinary vanishing islands which keep popping up you are greeted with the ship of your club sponsor and this is where you buy all your equipment now equipment lots of different stuff out there i'm not going to go again into the intricacies of them all however they do tend to fall into certain categories at this point and these are things which you should see pretty much every time you go there the first thing is foodstuffs now the foodstuffs can be anything from tin cans chocolate or whiskey sometimes cocoa uh, there's all sorts out there now when it comes to this game especially curious expedition 2 sanity 
and the juggling of sanity is the key to winning you need to take as much sanity preserving or sanity reviving items as you can so foodstuffs is one of the top things you should be focusing on there are certain perks and um, uh, foibles with certain items for instance whiskey has a higher output in sanity gain but there is a chance of you having someone become an alcoholic which is very hard to manage when you're out there and you have no whiskey left uh, there are other items which you can buy which have negative traits uh, and then you have on the opposite opposite end of things tin cans where you get a very small sanity gain but you can only have them up to a certain sanity uh, level and then you can't eat anymore until that sanity goes down again have a play about with your foodstuffs but foodstuffs is the priority when it comes to you spending the majority of your money unless you have other ways of accumulating sanity whilst you're out on the trek the next thing to think about is medikits. There are going to be times where you are in fights and people get injured or you are doing uh, random rolls on situations which pop up and people are getting injured. Uh, you may even come across times where uh, you need to doll out the medikits to other people not in your trek. Medikits are important. They are also quite expensive. So it's something which I recommend you get. There are down the line a chance of you getting certain perks when you finish uh, the expeditions where you get free medikits. But it's all, always good to take one or two medikits into any expedition because you never quite know what's going to happen. You then have a choice, usually, of either rope or climbing gear. Uh, okay, so since recording this, the powers that be have decided that rope should now be an equipable item on a Trek member. It's something you pick up either in a shop or out on your treks, and it has one side painted green, just one side, but it still has the advantages that both rope and mountain gear have, which is where we'll carry on with this video right now. Both of these serve a, a slightly different purpose but they are all to do with making you have an easier time over certain terrains rope tends to help you through swamps and climbing gear tends to help you climbing hills both of these are not necessary but again they can be quite handy and they are usually relatively cheap something to think about if you've got a bit of extra money hanging about the next one is shovels back in the day in the original game they were used to dig up certain treasures and that was pretty much it these days shovels do have uh, a few more options available to them uh, as well as digging up treasure so it might be worth taking one or two again they are relatively cheap but they are by no means necessary but again if, if you want to take them just to cover any eventuality you might come across on your travels it might be worth having a punt on some of those uh, the new unique thing about you know, curious expedition 2 is these tonics we have red green and blue tonics uh, they are quite expensive uh, however they are used to compensate for any low color dyes you may uh, have or not have as the case may be so for instance if i've got lots of red and green sides to my dye available but i'm running low on blue it might be worth buying a couple of blue tonics just to tease you up in case you need to do any particular roles where blue is uh, more paramount than red or green and vice versa and vice versa it all depends on the colors you want to go for as i said they are quite expensive you can always sell so any of these on if you want any of these items but they, it can be useful if you are top-sided on a particular color and you need to just balance out the rest of the colors it is good to keep as even a spread of the color side dye as you can that is a lot easier said, said than done but again those tonics are there just to help you out if you are struggling uh, when it comes to the colors uh, we then have torches. Now, torches, as far as I'm concerned, are the most valuable item that you can buy. There are several different ways you can use torches. They, well, light up stuff, obviously. They can be used in battle, and they can be used to help you uh, when searching tombs and whatnot. They are very OP for what they are uh, worth and I personally like to take as many as I can muster and worst case scenario once again you can always sell them off uh, but against other items or worst case scenario worst worst case scenario you can always throw them away because they're so cheap but torches as far as I'm concerned is something which you should always go with as many as you can muster one thing which pops up every so often and it's one thing which I refer back to my original tutorial about which again is paramount if you get the opportunity to take it a tent tents were reintroduced halfway through the alpha and it's oh god you miss a tent when you can't have it you definitely miss a tent if you were to buy a tent you don't need to buy any foodstuffs which is great uh, it is basically a portable 
place you can stop and uh, get your sanity back. So uh, foodstuffs is not needed whatsoever. They are quite expensive, but again, that should be offset by how useful they are. Generally speaking, when it comes to buying stuff, only buy what you're going to need. Uh, so foodstuffs, medikits, torches, straight away, get as many as you can. If you have any spare money after that, then you can start mixing and matching with other items. That also goes for any items you might open up via the clubs again we're not going into that now because i haven't opened them all up so i don't want to tell you what's good and what's not because i don't know about all that but that is something we'll come to at a later point and then you are on to the expedition generic tips or as generic a tip as i can give you uh without uh, being too fine on any points um sanity is paramount sanity is what the aim of the game is managing your sanity in this game i feel is a lot more difficult than it is in the older game there are several ways to lose your sanity there are several ways to gain your sanity i tend to find and i don't think this is my play style this is just in general uh, i tend to run out of sanity very quickly now because of this uh, there are some things you can do in order to make your life a little bit easier when it comes to uh, getting as far as you can on your original sanity level before you're having to replenish it with either supplies or uh, from anything else on the map which you come across generally speaking use hills because you'll get a better view of the surrounding area and therefore you'll be able to see more and be able to think about where you're going to be going first movement costs more sanity as well so if you're standing still and you can move uh, two, two or three spaces or up to 10 spaces it makes sense to move in one foul swoop in 10 spaces than it is two or three because that base unit cost every time you move is going to be a lot again the advantage of of moving is obviously less sanity the disadvantage is if anything was to come across your path in the meantime um, you do have a chance that they could ambush you if you let them get too close however you can stop yourself whenever you want by pressing cancel so it's not super important but um, obviously it's something to just keep in mind you don't need a cook these days either in order to cook food the food will come out super super burnt and you will get very little sanity off it but you don't need to worry about cooking your food up each time or having meat around which you can't use. Personally, I'm at the point where if I've got a cook, obviously I'm going to use it. If I don't have a cook, I try and find other ways of replenishing my sanity and keeping that meat to trade against. But again, that is something which is entirely up to you. As I've said already, the dice you have are as important, if not more important, than they ever have been you need as even a spread of dye as you can so blues greens reds arguably reds as far as battling is concerned is more important because uh, they generally are your uh, attack die however from someone who is in the mindset that the reds are the best i have noticed that i have failed several times on not so much green dice checks but blue dice checks and um talking from someone who has got to the end of the story believe me when i say it's good to have a nice even spread of color dice for the end so that's something you'll probably want to work from from the start in order to to be able to cover yourself uh, so yeah try and get as, as even a spread and as many dice sides available as you can hence why you want to upgrade the equipment or choose better items from the shady dealer with more sides available as opposed to just hitting harder my biggest thing i take away when playing the game when it comes to looting shrines is be on the right side of the shrine now when i say be on the right side of the shrine if you are hitting a shrine uh, because you've just come across it generally speaking nine times out of ten there will be a curse on that shrine which is going to affect the immediate area be it caverns which are going to pop up mountains which are going to pop up floods which are going to follow you so therefore you need to be on the side of the shrine where you want to move away from as opposed to being on the side of the shrine and having to move through the shrine in order to carry on with your journey that is just something which i do and i've got into the habit of doing in order to be able to get as far away from the shrine as quickly as i can uh, and again that's something which i think it might be worth uh, doing for you as well so there you go and the last thing i'd like to say about the expedition itself is don't be afraid to double back in order to rest if you come across any villages if you come across any uh, natural places you can rest like um, under um, uh, waterfalls and whatnot or at springs if you are running low on sanity and you have no way of regaining that sanity and it's safe to do so just go back and rest get yourself up to full sanity again and then you can carry on as i said to you already uh, sanity management in this game is far more important than it was in the original game to the point where uh, you will be punished heavily if you don't keep your sanity at a decent uh, level 
it, yes, it may cost you a bit of time as far as uh, having to double back and get your sanity back up and moving about again, but you're not necessarily in a race to finish first like you were in the first game. It's better to finish than it is to not, obviously. So uh, don't worry about having to go back and, and sort of waste time, as it were, in order to be able to carry on. Now, as far as the party members are concerned, there are a few things to note which uh, weren't available in the first game. First things first is members these days can like, love and hate each other within the group. What this means is if you have people who like or love each other, you actually get a sanity boost on that and your maximum capacity of sanity goes up. However, if they hate each other, you get a negative sanity hit. Now, this can be something where uh, you have to sort of weigh up how many perks you've got or how, how much benefits you've got for people loving each other compared to hating each other, because at times you'll find that certain members will love one person but hate another. And hopefully, if, if the, the numbers have fallen right for you, you'll find that that will outweigh the negative parts. Because of this, I have found that sometimes it might be worth getting rid of certain members of the group in order for the group to prosper now this might mean that your strategy as it were he says of inverted commas is going to falter for a while until you find a, a suitable replacement but if people start hating each other and morale goes down and if they start falling out the loyalty will go down as well the more members will be willing to leave you over slight annoyances as opposed to just taking it on the chin and obviously if you haven't got members you're missing out on die you're missing out on carrying capacity and you're missing out on perks so it's best to keep people as sweet as possible for as long as possible uh, now generally speaking when it comes to promoting people i tend to promote people with sanity boosting perks first over other uh, perks available to me uh, i then tend to decide to promote members where um, they will get more sides to their dice again just trying to cover as many bases as you can as far as those uh, die sides are concerned so perks first then die sides now as far as battling's concerned uh well not a lot's changed it has got a little bit easier to see what's going on as far as bo uh, boosts are concerned and combos are concerned they are a lot more easier to work out on the page now saying that if you find that there are certain members of your parties who have awesome attacks and need a certain color is it's obviously best for that playthrough to cater for them however an even spread of die colors again is the most effective way of getting through any battle because you're going to have all possibilities available to you uh, as far as characters are concerned enemy characters this is uh, always take out the healer first because obviously anything that you're doing in damage they are negating with heals so uh, that is something to uh, to focus on and to hopefully take down in one or two goes stuns are better than weak attacks also especially against tougher single creatures if you can stun them that means that you are negating an attack on a certain die that they may have or a certain attack they've got lined up for next time around uh, so that is something which can be very powerful especially when it comes to anyone who's got super hard attacks you know if they're hitting hitting you for 10 plus or they've got a group attack going on where several of your uh, members are going to be hurt at the same time if you can stun that that is obviously going to negate a lot of damage coming your way which is a good thing obviously uh, now so as far as priority is concerned i tend to try and do stuns first then issuing any vulnerabilities onto people and then the attack shields which is your blue die generally are also a good way of uh, protecting your group from group attack however it is something which um, again as far as my playthroughs are concerned because i have less blue die available to me <laughs> at least on this playthrough uh, it's something which um, i had to cater for uh, which uh, was a bit more difficult to do but shield is a viable way of going if you have that blue die available to you and as far as after battles are concerned you may feel the need to jump straight into applying your medikits don't unless you are uh, certain that you will be getting into another fight very soon and you have uh, somebody who's very low on the health leave the medikits alone you will heal naturally as you move around the map the time to use any medikit is when someone is infected with um well an infection because of the natural healing properties you have you may find that nine times out of ten all your party members get up to full health before you get into trouble again without having to use one and if you go about using your medikit sooner rather than later uh, you then may find that down the line 
you will need a medikit which you no longer have. So don't use your medikits until you really, really need to. And then hopefully you will complete your expedition and get back to Paris. And at this point, you will be showered with praise and, and love and more important, fame and tickets. As I said before, fame accumulates into tickets, which in turn allows you to go out there and spend your money on new equipment and all the other things we spoke about early on as far as that's all concerned again i'm not going to go into the ins and outs of it right now have a mess about have a play you can't go far wrong make educated decisions that's as that's as much as you can do and obviously the more you play the more you'll know but hopefully at this point you will have uh, a few hints and tips available to you which will help your first few goes into this game that is it i hope you found this helpful i hope i haven't ranted too much until next time thank you for watching as always a like is appreciated and i'll catch you on the next one take it easy